What's going on guys, my name is Matt, and this computer may not look like much from the outside, but on the inside is one of the most powerful gaming PCs I've ever built. I've been wanting to do a sleeper PC build for a really long time and knew that if I was going to do it, I wanted to pull out all the stops, and that's exactly what I did. For those who don't know what a sleeper PC is, it's essentially a PC that looks very boring and mundane from the outside but has amazing components on the inside. This trend is inspired from sleeper cars where people would take very unassuming cars and cram them full of race car internals. The first thing I needed to get this project started was a case. This would determine the look of the system System, the components I could fit inside, and determine what mods would need to be done. You might think finding an old computer or case like this would be easy, but locally I couldn't find anything and going on to eBay I was shocked to see the going rate for vintage computer cases. Because I wasn't prepared to drop $150 or more on just the case, I waited and watched listings for a few months. That is, until I stumbled upon this guy right here. This is an eMachine T8115 dating back nearly 20 years. I managed to get this for $40 shipped which really wasn't a bad deal considering what others were paying for similar cases. I knew going into this that the case I chose wasn't going to be the easiest to build in and would require some modding, but honestly that's what I was the most excited for. The process of taking an old case like this and figuring out how to fit new components into it was probably the most fun part of the entire project. Once I got the case in hand I knew it was going to be great for this build. It looks exactly like the boring beige desktops you could find in a lot of homes in the early 2000s. It still had a lot of the stickers on it touting the specs including a blazing fast 850MHz single core Celeron and has a Windows Millennium Edition sticker on it. This was great as it just adds to the sleeper theme. Opening the system up, I found a relatively clean, complete system minus a hard drive. This system had multiple 5 and a quarter inch drives, floppy drive, and other parts synonymous with this era of computing. The first thing I noticed that would be a big challenge was going to be trying to fit an ATX power supply into this system. The unit that came with it was considerably smaller than an ATX one and there wasn't enough length for even a relatively short unit. After taking a look at this old system in all of its glory, I began the teardown process. Now don't worry, all of this hardware isn't going to waste. I plan on using it in a future video to take a look back at what an average desktop was like from a few decades back. Once all apart, I was left with a steel box as a blank canvas to build upon and mod. I started by removing all the stickers on the inside and back of the case. Of course these didn't come off easy, but after a little work to remove the stickers themselves and some rubbing alcohol to remove the adhesive, they were all gone. The first mod that needed to be done was removing the drive case. While I needed to make the PC look original from the outside, there was absolutely no need for optical drives and this cage would keep an ATX power supply from fitting in. All I had to do was remove a few rivets and pop the cage out. This gave me the length needed for the power supply, but the journey to fitting it in was far from over. I removed a few metal tabs to make room using a combination of a Dremel and just a pair of pliers, bending the tabs back and forth, which worked surprisingly well. I needed to remove these two indents, which I originally was going to drill out, stepping up in bit size until they were gone, but I soon realized I didn't have a bit large enough to do this, so I drilled four holes large enough for a jigsaw blade to fit into and cut out a section of metal that contained the two indents. I rough cut the hole, then cleaned it up with a few more passes. Now, this isn't great looking, but it certainly gets the job done. Doing all this gave me enough room to slide the PSU in and realize it barely wouldn't fit because of the I.O. bracket. One spin of the Dremel disc and twist of a plier later and there was finally room for it to slide right into place. To drill mounting holes for this, I made a template on paper using a power supply and used that template to mark and drill holes. I was really careful to measure a ton of times and drill once because once a hole's drilled, there's no refilling it and that hole is there to stay. Luckily, my method worked and I was able to secure securely mount the power supply even if it was only with three screws because I wasn't able to use the fourth mounting hole. I then removed some more metal tabs that stuck out and drilled out these two weird brass standoffs. These sat higher than the motherboard standoffs and could have caused a short if not removed. I next wanted to add some fans. The components the system came with were pretty low powered so high airflow really wasn't necessary, but the PC I was planning on putting in here was a different story and needed good airflow to prevent thermal throttling. Because of this, I decided to add an intake and exhaust fan. For the exhaust fan, 
I decided to use the 92mm Noctua NF-B9. This is a really high quality fan and I like the neutral grey color scheme as well. I began by marking and drilling holes where I wanted the fan to mount. I then mounted the fan on the outside of the case so I could trace a circle that I could cut out to allow for good airflow. I simply cut this hole out with a jigsaw. I could have used a hole saw but didn't feel like purchasing one specifically for this project as I don't know if I would make use of it in the future. The hole didn't turn out perfect but it works well enough and I planned on putting this metal grate to protect the fan. This fan, like the PSU, could only be mounted in three of the four mounting holes. This is because this I.O. cutout was right where the fourth screw would go. Not ideal, but again it works out fine. For the front intake, I went with a Noctua NFP12 which is pressure optimized. This is ideal because there are only a few openings for air to get into the front, so a high pressure fan is a must. I drilled holes for the fan to mount to, then cut out a large hole using a jigsaw so the fan had as much air to pull air in as possible. The hole isn't pretty, but it's covered by a dust filter so it wasn't a big deal to me. Once the front fan mount was complete, it meant it was time to get the chassis ready for paint. I first made sure to round over all the sharp edges to both make it look good and to make it safe. If I had left these edges unfiled, there would be a pretty high chance I could have accidentally cut myself on one of these edges, which certainly would not have been a fun time. Once filing was done, I went ahead and started to scuff up all the surfaces with sandpaper that I would be painting. This allows the paint to adhere to the metal better and create a strong bond. I then cleaned off all the dust and metal shavings. I even hosed the whole thing down just to get things out of every nook and cranny. While letting the chassis dry completely, I created a makeshift paint booth out of moving paper and tape. I decided to use two colors of paint. The first is this light gray color which would be the main color and I also got a can of this light blue paint to act as an accent. I began with the gray paint. I simply shook up the can and sprayed in short light strokes making sure not to lay the paint on too thick. Then I waited 30 minutes or so, applied another coat, and repeated this a few times until I had the finish I wanted. I also made sure to paint the smaller parts I wanted gray while I was spraying the chassis gray. After around 4 coats, I let the paint dry overnight before painstakingly masking off the case for the next color. This took a while but was necessary to get the paint job I wanted. I then painted the exposed interior with the light blue color I mentioned earlier, using 3 or 4 coats as I did with the gray. I let this dry out overnight again and was ready to reveal the finished paint job. Pulling off the tape was pretty satisfying and the end result looked pretty nice. The combo of this gray and blue is really visually pleasing in my opinion and it also matches the parts I put in the system really well. The case was looking a little rough with all the mods and cuts but after paint it cleaned up the look of the chassis a lot. While the interior was now ready, the exterior still needed some work. Because I removed both of the 5 and a quarter inch drive bays, it left two large holes in the front panel, which if not addressed, definitely would have blown this sleeper PC's cover. The top bay was easy, I just popped the cover off the drive that was in there and then glued both of the pieces to the front panel. This maintains the original look of the 5 and a quarter inch drive without the internal bulk of actually having it. For the second drive slot, which could be covered by this plastic piece that's meant to hinge out, but the hinges are broken, it still stays on fine but isn't ideal. Because this was going to be hidden a lot of the time, I figured I could slip in some modern front panel I.O. to make this a much more functional PC. I picked up this 5 and a quarter inch I.O. enclosure on Amazon to use. It has USB ports and front panel audio. The only problem is I took out all the mounts for 5 and a quarter inch drives. My solution was to cut, bend, and cut some more of the 5 and a quarter inch drive bay until I was left with this mess of bent metal and these two little brackets. These would be used to mount the enclosure while also taking up as little space as possible. I disassembled the enclosure, cut it down to size, and then painted the interior pieces blue and the exterior pieces gray. Once painted, I reassembled the I.O. enclosure to prepare it for install. To put it in the case, I needed to attach my makeshift brackets. I did this with the help of my cheap rivet kit I got off Amazon. All you have to do is hold the two pieces of metal together, insert the largest rivet you can through both holes, insert the rod into the tool, and squeeze to install. This pulls the two pieces of metal together and creates a strong bond. Then all I had to do was slide the enclosure into place and secure it with a few screws. The neutral gray I picked actually blends in pretty well with the original plastic of the case, meaning even with this 5 and a quarter inch I.O. exposed, it doesn't look too out of place on a quick glance. 
I was super happy with how this turned out, but needed to keep moving as there were more challenges to overcome. I next had to figure out a power button for the system. The front panel connectors were just this one proprietary cable with no labeling about leads. After taking a look at the power button PCB, I realized I could just visually trace the leads for each component to the pins on the board. Once I figured out the pinout, I needed to figure out how to connect those pins to the motherboard. What I decided to do was merge the proprietary connector with the standard motherboard front panel connectors. This way I could plug directly from the power button PCB to the motherboard IO headers. I stripped down each wire, soldered the corresponding cables, then heat shrunk each connection. Doing a quick test, I found the power button and power LEDs were working, but the hard drive activity light was not. I tried to switch around pins, but couldn't get it to work. I was fine with this as the power button and power LED were the most important things I wanted to work on that PCB. With all the drive bays filled and the power button working, it meant it was time to start filling this bad boy with some serious powerful hardware. This is a pretty overkill system I put in here. Not all the part selections make that much sense, but I used a combination of stuff I had on hand and stuff I got for future projects. Either way, this is still the most powerful system I've ever built. For the CPU, I knew I was going to go Ryzen just because I still haven't found a compelling reason to go Intel in a long time. I was originally going to get a Ryzen 5 3600 because this is kind of the price to performance king of gaming CPUs at $200, but at the time of getting parts, Ryzen 7 2700s were going for $165. This would give a little less gaming performance but would have a good bump in workstation applications and will probably be used in my personal rig in the near future. This is an 8 core 16 thread overclockable CPU that's absolutely amazing performance wise, especially for only $165. I was able to get this particular one up to 4 GHz on an AMD Wraith cooler, which gives around a 15% performance boost above stock. The motherboard this is going into is another great price to performance part. This is the ASRock B450M Pro 4, a 75 ish dollar motherboard with a lot of great features. It has a decent VRM setup, 4 DIMM slots, 2 M.2 slots, and more than adequate back panel I.O. It also doesn't hurt that it has a very neutral and in my opinion good looking color scheme. For RAM, I went with 32GB of XPG DDR4 at 3200MHz. This is a 2x16GB kit with CL16 timings. At around $115 at the price of purchasing, this is some of the best price to performance RAM ever and probably will end up in my personal rig at some point. It looks decent and 32GB is super overkill for gaming, but it's perfect for many workstation tasks including editing videos. For the graphics card, I went with an NVIDIA RTX 2080 Super, which is the most powerful graphics card I've ever had the privilege to play with. This is courtesy of NVIDIA and I got it when I was invited up to their headquarters with some other tech YouTubers. I even got to meet Jensen, which was pretty sweet and super surreal. This is the Founders Edition card, which I know is kind of polarizing design-wise. I really like the look of it, it performs great and really stands out among other open air cards. Performance on this guy is insane, which I'll show in the benchmarks, and this silver and black color scheme fit perfectly with the entire build. Powering the system is an EVGA Supernova 650G+. I knew I needed a modular power supply and had this guy on hand which worked great for this build. It's 80 plus gold rated, has full black cables, and provides plenty of clean power to the entire system. Storage is the place that makes the least sense in this build. I just threw in a 256GB ADATA SU800, which is a great value for the money M.2 SSD with DRAM. If I were building the system without the intention of tearing it down soon after completing it, then I probably would have went with something like a 500GB NVMe boot drive and a 2TB SATA M.2 for mass storage. I really wanted to avoid regular SATA hard drives and SSDs just because of how little room was in this build. Building the PC went surprisingly smooth, I was very excited to see all the parts did indeed fit, many of which were about as big as they could possibly be. There's no room for cable management in anywhere other than the main compartment, so it was a little difficult to neaten everything up, but in the end I think it looks pretty clean. The colors of the parts with the colors of the case all go together really well. With it all put together, I decided to test a few games just to get an idea of the performance the system's putting out. Starting out with Dune 2016, I tested at 1440p with the highest preset. This system easily produced an average well above 120 FPS. This was a pretty incredible experience being able to play with that high of both visual quality and frame rate. 
Next, I tested Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1440p max settings and on the built-in benchmark got an average of 91, which again is pretty impressive for 1440p max settings. Finally, in Far Cry 5 at 1440p max settings, this produced an average of 75 FPS, which isn't quite as high as I would have liked to see. With the side panel and front panel on, during the end of a Fire Strike Ultra run, both the CPU and GPU were sitting right around 70 degrees Celsius, which isn't bad at all. Really, even though the front panel is pretty closed off, the system has decent airflow with the GPU being able to pull fresh air directly from the side vent. Overall, performance on this system is incredible, which was to be expected. I'm super happy I was able to keep the system looking very unassuming from the outside and pretty unique on the inside. Not all the mods were perfect, but I'm still kind of new to this type of thing, so I'm so proud of what I was able to accomplish. This project was, in my opinion, a complete success. Being able to take a nearly 20 year old system and modify it to fit powerful modern hardware was extremely fun, and I'm already thinking of ideas for my next DIY slash modding project. With all this being said, I think it's time to wrap this video up. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, give it a thumbs up as well as consider subscribing. And this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.